All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome aboard the Steve Malzberg Show on Monday from our New York City studios. Mitch McConnell coming up momentarily in an interview we did a little earlier. Uh, lots going on today. Donald Trump still hearing it now from Newt Gingrich, from Paul Ryan and other Republicans over his chastising and criticism of the uh, what he calls Mexican judge uh, in his Trump University case. And uh, Alberto Gonzalez, former U.S. Attorney General who's of Mexican heritage, actually sticks up for Trump in a Washington Post op-ed. We'll talk about that. Also, Bernie Sanders says he's not going anywhere, even as uh, tomorrow looms uh, bright for Hillary. She'll win New Jersey. Whether or not she wins California, looks like she'll get the delegates that she needs to get the nomination. So we have a lot to talk about. Um, also, the death of Muhammad Ali. Uh, Michael Reagan joins us in the next segment. But first, I started out with Mitch McConnell, Majority Leader of the U.S. Senate, author of The Long Game, a memoir, by simply welcoming him to the show. Glad to be with you. Uh, okay, let, let's start, you know, a, a couple of things. I think most people that, that are going to read this book, they're going to find out so many fascinating things about you and your life, which really is a, a, a wonderful story. And I guess the, the one that everybody's talking about when they talk to you is that, I mean, who knew that you had polio? This was before the polio vaccine, obviously. Uh, my father was uh, in the Army fighting the Germans in World War II. My, my mother's two-year-old son comes down with polio in his left leg, a partial uh, paralysis. Uh, the only good news about the story was we were about an hour's drive away from Warm Springs, Georgia, where uh, President Roosevelt <clears throat> had set up a uh, polio treatment center for other victims like, like himself. Uh, my mother uh, took me over there. The nurses trained her in how to do a physical therapy regimen for my left leg said they needed, she needed to do that four times a day, and she needed further to keep me from trying to walk because they were afraid if I did what other youngsters that age were doing and trying to learn how to walk, uh, the muscle would not have the kind of recovery that it had the potential to have. She did that for two years, watched me like a hawk every waking hour, and my first uh, memory in life was the last visit to Warm Springs where they told my mother, uh, looked like I was going to be able to walk without a brace and without a limp. And, 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 and to your mom, doing everything counterintuitive for that, for that long a time with a two-year-old boy. Uh, she was a miracle worker, and, and, and thank God she did it. All right, you also uh, reveal that uh, you say your, your failure at baseball, um, and I don't know to what degree you failed, but uh, your, your, your failure in baseball actually led to your interest in, in politics and, and possibly your political career. Yeah, well, you know, I got interested in sports like uh, most uh, little boys. I worked hard, got pretty good at it, and started feeling a little cocky and thinking I was uh, maybe some, maybe even had professional potential <laughs> here. So uh, I had my first really big humbling moment. Uh, it was an all-star game. We went in to play the city all-stars. Uh, they, they had a better feel than we did. They were bigger than we were, and they were better than we are. And I had a chance to watch that for a few innings. Uh, getting nervous uh, thinking about going in and pitching the second half of the game. Uh, so I go in and I walk the bases loaded. And then I walk another guy, one run is in, and I said, boy, I'm going to get the ball over. And did I? Uh, the next guy hit a home run. So, you know, it dawned on me that probably my athletic career was going to peak at a fairly early age. And so I looked around and found some other way to compete. Uh, very similar to sports and baseball, and that is uh, politics. All right, let, let me let me switch gears a little bit and, and ask you a, a bunch of questions here about what's going on. How do you react to the people who say that you, as the majority leader of the Senate, something you, you, you wanted and you got, uh, and, and John Boehner, the Speaker of the House, that you two are in, in, in large part responsible, if you will, for the rise of Donald Trump? Uh, my answer is that's nonsense. Uh, <laughs> what, what you have to do in Congress is do the best you can with the government you have. And the government we have right now is divided. We have a president who has a whole different approach to life than, than we do. And so there's not a whole lot we can agree on, but we do have to do basic work. And we're trying to focus on things that, while they may not make big headlines, uh, need doing, like rewriting uh, No Child Left Behind, which is very important very, very popular with conservatives. We even got Obama to sign it, like passing a six-year or five-year highway bill. That hadn't been done in 20 years. Or cybersecurity, or comprehensive energy, or uh, opioid and heroin addiction. Things that are important, 
that we could get some agreement on and get a presidential signature. At the same time, we have big differences. You know, we'd love to repeal Obamacare. We put it on the president's desk, and of course, uh, he vetoed it. So I would say to conservative critics, if you want to change America, you have to have a president who will sign the bills that change America, not one who will veto them. All right, but let, let, let me play what you said shortly after you won, and it was apparent that you would be the, uh, the majority leader of the Senate, that the, uh, that the Senate was going Republican. You gave a press conference, and a lot of people uh, say that, uh, you know, a lot of conservatives, a lot of frustrated conservatives say that you waved the white flag saying that you will not shut down the government. Here's some of what you said. I'm not sure he's going to sign everything, um, but... We're going to function. We, we are. We're, we're going to pass legislation. Um, some of it he may not like, but we're, we're going to function. Uh, th this this uh, gridlock and dysfunction can be ended. It can be ended by having a Senate that actually, <clears throat> excuse me, that actually works. All right. I mean, did you wave a white flag by saying we're not going to shut down the government? Isn't that basically saying to Obama, you could get away with whatever you want because we're not going to we're not going to shut down the government. Yeah, it's saying we're not going to do stupid things that the public hates. The public hates government shutdown. We tried that in the 90s uh, when it was tried in 2013 when I was not the majority leader. Uh, our party approval rating went down 10 points, the biggest dip in history. So, yeah, I said that I, I said we're, we're not doing dumb stuff anymore. We're not going to shut the government down and turn off the public and make it less likely we win the next election. Absolutely, I said that, and I would say it again. But didn't you, with all due respect, didn't your landslide victory, which, which catapulted you into your current position, occur after a government, not too long after a government shutdown, where you had uh, Senator Cruz on the floor of the, uh, of the Senate, uh, you know, reading, uh, filibustering, and, and, and yeah. I, I mean, so you... Yeah, it, it, if I may interrupt, it took a whole year to recover from that, and the only thing that saved us was the Obamacare rollout happened about the same time as the government shutdown and took all the attention off of it. But our party label tanked 10 points during that ridiculous shutdown to get the president to defund Obamacare. Obamacare wouldn't have been affected by a government shutdown, so it had no impact on Obamacare. And obviously Obama was not going to sign a bill repealing Obamacare. So it gets back to the point I made. We're not doing dumb things anymore. This is a responsible, right of center, governing majority, hoping to get a president who will sign legislation that allows us to begin to move the country in a different direction. Right. Let, me, let me tell you what we do have ball control on. The Supreme Court. Are you satisfied with the list uh, that uh, Donald Trump put out? I am, but let me, let me make the point here. Uh, don't interrupt me. Let me make the point. I'm sorry. I thought you were we have ball yeah. control. We have ball, we have ball control on the Supreme Court. He appoints, but we decide whether to confirm. And as soon as this vacancy occurred, since it occurred during the middle of a presidential year, I said we're not going to allow this president on the way out the door uh, to tilt the f Supreme Court to the left for the next generation. We're not going to fill it. We're going to wait and see who the American people choose. And Donald Trump, as you started to suggest, has put out a, a list of highly qualified nominees, the kind of people he would nominate for the Supreme Court. I find that very reassuring. Uh, all the people in the country right of center find it very reassuring. This was an issue upon which I had total control. We didn't have to get a presidential signature. I laid down the marker. We're not filling this vacancy with Barack Obama's appointment. It'll be filled by the person who wins the next uh, election for president. And I think that was a wonderful move. I, I praised it at the time, and I praise you again uh, to, your, to your face. Let me ask you about something you said yesterday, uh, if we could play 106. This is uh, about uh, uh, Hispanics and Donald Trump and his uh, attack, as you put it, I think, on, uh, on Suzanne Martinez recently. Here's, here's what you said. Do you worry at all that your nominee now, Donald Trump, will do to Latino voters what Barry Goldwater did to African-American voters? I do. I do. And I think that the attacks uh, that he's routinely engaged in, uh, for example, uh, going after Susana Martinez, the Republican governor of New Mexico, the chairman of the Republican Governors Association, I think was a big mistake. Now, there's some evidence today, Senator, or uh, that uh, this uh, relationship may be thawing a bit. Uh, Trump says he wants her endorsement. She says he has to address the concerns of New Mexico, which doesn't sound all that hard to do if he chooses to do it. Uh, but uh, are you aware that uh, 
According to the Washington Post, uh, back in April, at a Koch brother fundraiser, Suzanne Martinez uh, went on the attack against Trump uh, about his rhetoric, his language, the wall, etc. So, you know, when Donald Trump feels he's attacked, he tends to respond. Yeah, and I think that's a big mistake because he's won. What people expect of uh, people when they win is to be gracious, uh, to reach out, to try to bring those who oppose you in the past uh, together. That's how you unify the party. Uh, Donald and I have had several conversations about this. I, I think the attacks on, on Republicans that, that he needs to unify and win the election ought to stop. It's not a smart strategy. And I think particularly picking on one of the most uh, popular and successful governors uh, in the country, particularly one who also happens to be uh, Hispanic, is the sort of thing that doesn't make any sense at this point. He needs to pivot to the general election, unify the Republican Party, and go after Hillary Clinton. All right, one final one, uh, sir. Um, the violence that we saw last week uh, at uh, the uh, San Jose Trump rally, the, one, the violence we've seen uh, before that, uh, this one was uh, particularly uh, awful. No police outside. Trump supporters out of the rally event were being attacked. Um, I, want, I want to read you what the mayor of San Jose uh, said. Uh, he said at some point Donald Trump needs to take responsibility for the irresponsible behavior of his campaign. Are you, are, what's your reaction to the violence that we're seeing? And are you fearful this could go on and just swell as we head into uh, to the convention? Gee, I don't know. I don't, I don't want to cast blame at anybody. You, you, when you have big crowds like that, you're never quite sure who starts what. Uh, I do think it, that Americans need to remember that uh, we, we have a peaceful democracy here. Everybody's free to say whatever they want to, and nobody needs to throw any punches to make a point at anybody's rallies, whether it's Bernie Sanders or Donald Trump or Hillary Clinton's. All right. Again, folks, the book is The Long Game, uh, a memoir by uh, the majority leader of the U.S. Senate, Mitch McConnell, who has a great, great story. Uh, it's all in this book. And, uh, Senator, thank you very much for joining us and for, for debating the issues. I really appreciate it, sir. You bet. Thanks a lot. All right, ladies and gentlemen, that's how it went. A lot of, a lot of good stuff in there. We're going to talk about it in the next segment with Michael Reagan and take your phone calls at 877-NEWSMAX, so don't go away.